Welcome to the ESC Live Plymouth Energy from Waste event. Today, you're going to learn about what happens to the non-recyclable waste that you produce and how engineers are using this waste as an alternative source of fuel to create electricity. We're also going to show you a bit of an insight into the wide range of engineering careers available, and you're going to meet a number of engineers during and after the tour of the facility. So let's do some introductions. I'm Dr. Natalie Whitehead. I'm one of the founders and directors of the Exeter Science Centre. We're trying to create an amazing science discovery centre in Exeter for the whole of the Southwest region. I'm a physicist, and um, before this, I was actually an engineer designing buildings. Um, I'm co-hosting this event today alongside the inspiring engineer and university lecturer, Dr. Adam Feldman. Adam, if you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Hi, everyone. My name's Dr. Adam Feldman, and I'm an engineer. I work as a lecturer at the University of Exeter. And what a lecturer is at a university is a kind of teacher, but we do more than just teaching. We actually research and try to invent various gadgets at the same time. So we're half teacher, half inventor, researcher. And I work in the department of energy engineering, renewable energy engineering for the university. And we may be called the University of Exeter, but our energy department is down in Cornwall, near to Falmouth. Some of you may have traveled down that way before. And I'll be doing my best to help answer some questions and explain things as we go on our tour. Thank you Thanks, very Natalie. much, Adam. Brilliant. Um, and now we have Dr. Alice Mills, who's keeping an eye on the YouTube live chat comments. Please, if you can introduce yourself, Alice. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Alice Mills. I am one of the co-founders and co-directors of Exeter Science Centre, and I will be monitoring your questions and putting them to our wonderful um, tour guide today, Jane. Um, so, yeah, do send us your questions. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Alice. And behind the scenes, we have Robin Mudge, who's a former BBC Science producer, one of the Exeter Science Centre's advisors. He's directing the event and running this live stream broadcast for us. Thanks so much, Robin. Now, our star of the show, who will introduce herself and start us off on the tour, please, Jane Ford. Thanks very much, Jane. Hi, thanks, ladies. So welcome, everybody, to our NG from Waste Facility here in Plymouth. And as you've already heard, we're going to find out exactly what happens to the residual waste that's left over after recycling that we don't want to be sending to landfill anymore. So we'll see what happens as it arrives. I'm going to turn my camera around. We're starting at the Weybridge and we'll just follow it through logically. So, move with me one moment. You should now be able to see, not my face covered in a mask, but our access road. This is where the lorries come in. So the dust carts that collect the rubbish that will be in your brown bins will come directly to us. Here we've got the way bridge. We've got an in bridge and an out bridge over there. So we weigh the lorries when they come in and when they go back out. Perhaps you'd like to have a think about why we need to do that. And this is manned at all times during delivery hours, which are from eight in the morning till seven in the evening. And we're just going to walk up now the route that the lorries would go. So they come up the access road here and heading for the tipping hall. Just as we go past, on my left up ahead, you might be able to see this grey steam pipe. Where's my pointy finger? There it is. So that's actually some steam that we're sending to the dockyard for heating. And just on my right, you can see the scale of the building. So this largest part here in front of me is actually the waste bunker. We'll see that from the other side as well. And over here, we've got the boiler itself. So you'll see an outline on your diagrams that you've got to be completing here. I don't know, Adam, just while I'm walking, if you want to take over for a moment, we're just heading towards the water treatment plant. So we need water that's very, very clean to go into our process because we're going to be generating steam from it. And just while I pay attention across the road, I shall hand over to Adam for a few seconds. Yes, thank you very much, Jane. So whilst Jane is 
taking the tour further to the waste hall where we're going in a moment, let's just consider what this gigantic building is. It's a power station, but this kind of power station works like a huge engine. And all engines work by converting heat, that's heat energy, into movement energy, kinetic energy. And they do that using a fluid. And the fluid we use in this particular engine is water. And we add heat to the water in a big fire. You'll see where that happens in a bit. It boils the water and turns it into steam and then elevates the pressure of that steam. And we use that steam in the engines we'll see later. But also that huge pipe that Jane pointed to a moment ago does something very special that we'll come back to afterwards. But what that pipe is doing is carrying the leftover steam after it's gone through the engine off to the industrial dockyard next door so that they can use any leftover heat. So water is a fantastic working uh, fluid for such an engine. And now we're in the hall. I'm going to pass back to Jane to show us the next bit of the tour. Lovely. Thanks very much, Adam. So we've actually got a lorry in at the moment. Most of the waste that we take is from households like yours but we also take some waste that's collected commercially by private customers like Biridor and Biffa, and they're predominantly collecting the same sort of waste, but from businesses, colleges, universities, possibly even your school. You can see that the lorries come in, back up, and then the waste is tipped down these big chutes. He's obviously just finished, but I think you can see down there. So this tipping bay is about eight metres deep, and, I mean, to give you an idea of scale, you could easily drive a Land Rover down this slope and into that tipping bay. From here, the waste is then moved by train into the main storage bunker that we will see in a moment. So I'm just going to cross over the tipping hall so that we can go out to the other side. And I'd like to be able to show you how much quieter it is. And in a moment, you'll see why. We need it to keep the other side of the building really, really quiet. You can hear how noisy it gets in here. The vehicle's moving around and tipping up. And so we've deliberately kept it in a completely enclosed space with one door in and one door back out. So they come in and out on what we call the noisy side of the building. Okay, perfect. A lovely colleague on the other side saying it's safe for us to cross. So we've got five tipping bays where the lorries deliver the waste. Over here in the corner, we've also got a quarantine bay. You can see that's a steel-lined concrete area where we can tip waste onto the floor if we need to check it. So to check that it's the sort of waste that we should be having and that it's not something that's going to damage our process. And these guys have a very important job making sure that the lorries all come in and tip safely. Thank you, Jen. Sorry to interrupt, Jane. I'm just going to, to encourage everyone to send us your questions. So please post them in the chat. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, you're probably so mesmerised by what you're seeing so far. But do send us your questions. We'd like to answer them as we go around. Carry on, Jane. So, we just shut the door behind us. It's much, much quieter. And if you look directly in front of me, you can see how very close we are to the nearest housing. So this is why we had to be very careful with the engineering and design of this, this particular facility to make sure that from the outside, we are no more than five decibels above background noise. Thank you very much. Sorry, just crossing the road. Safety first at all times. So not just these houses here, but also up on the hill over there are some more houses. And what we've done is shielded the tipping hall with our administration building. So these are offices, quiet spaces. When you come to visit us, which you will be able to do eventually, I'm sure, you'll be able to come actually inside. We've got a classroom and a lecture theatre there as well. And this section we're about to walk past 
is the waste bunker itself. It's one of the one of the largest parts of the building. And the reason for that is we're taking waste all of the time. We're taking around about 120 lorries a day, up to 1,000 tonnes of waste a day. And that continues even when we shut down for maintenance. And actually, we are shut down at the moment, so you get a unique opportunity to see inside the boiler itself where we burn the waste. Jane, I'm now, just going to interrupt you very quickly. Sorry, we've had some questions. If you don't oh, fantastic. Mind. Not at um, all. So how big is the overall facility? Okay, that's an excellent question. So the tallest structure that we have is the chimney. You can just see that in front of us there. That's 95 metres high. The next tallest bit is the boiler house, which is here. And tucked underneath this red bit is the turbine hall. That's 45 metres high. The height of the boiler house is determined by the residency time that we need for some chemicals to react with the flue gases to make sure they're safe to go up the chimney. In particular, that is for ammonia to react with oxides of nitrogen. And then the waste bunker that we just walked past, that's about 35 metres. And I'm actually going to lose you. Did you want to do it? Did you have another question? Uh, asked before? Yeah, one more now, which was um, you mentioned that some waste could damage the process. Which kind of waste would um, damage the process? OK, I've got a really quick, obvious example. If you've ever been camping and used a camping gas stove, please don't throw the camping gas cylinder in your residual waste bin. What do you think will happen to a pressurised container, even if it's empty, at 1,000 degrees, which is the temperature we burn at? Yes, you guessed it, they go bang. <laughs> so I'm actually going up to the control room, but I'm going to lose signal for a short while. So ladies, is it best if I go on to mute and let you guys take over for a moment? That's perfect. I think Adam has some Excellent. information to tell us about the, the power plant. Thank you. Super, then I shall see you up in the control room. Thanks, Jane. Right. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Natalie. Yes, this is such a special power station for many reasons. It does several really important jobs. First of all, it burns all the rubbish and waste that people from Plymouth and the surrounding areas want to get rid of and that we can't recycle. So it deals with that. It uses the heat to generate electricity, the power your house is, and our hospitals and our schools and everything around us. But it does something else. It provides heat to the huge Devonport dockyard next door. And that makes this power station something we call a combined heat and power plant. That means it's providing heat, useful heat, and power. And by power, we mean electricity. Most of our power stations that burn a fuel up until recently, and these include the coal-fired power stations, gas-fired power stations, what they do is they burn their fuel and they use the steam from that heating to generate electricity. And all of the leftover waste heat at a lower temperature, but still very, very hot, gets thrown out into the atmosphere into our environment. And it's such a waste. Because if you do that, only about a quarter of all the energy that's in that fuel, that coal, that gas, or in the case here, in the burning rubbish, is actually used for a good purpose. But in a combined heat and power plant, and we sometimes call it a CHP, combined heat and power plant, we use the leftover heat for a real great purpose. In the dockyard, they use it to heat the buildings, but also to power and run some of the machinery. And that means instead of 25%, a quarter of the energy from the fuel being used usefully, we are using a little over 50%. That's making it twice as efficient. And that's marvellous. I don't know, Jane, are you getting back to us? Jane is traveling up in this huge building, sometimes on the screen as we go round. It's difficult to appreciate how big some of this engineering is. But I think she's headed up many floors in this huge building to be at the top of the plant 
so we can look down into where all the fuel, which is the rubbish that you and I throw into our dustbins, is heading. Jane, have we got you? Perfect. Yes, I can see you, Jane. Let me pass back to you. Here we are in the control room, power station area of the facility. But first, let's go and see our fuel that we were watching being delivered. So you should be able to see over in the corner our crane. And so that crane will lift about eight tonnes of waste at a time. And just over there, you can see the, see the wall here. That's separating the main bunker from the reception bays that we saw when we were down in the tipping hall. So the crane moves the waste into the main storage bunker. You can see it's quite high at the moment, and that's because we're shut down for some great repairs, which is where the waste normally would be burning. Jean, is it? There's, the crane, oh, sorry. There's yep. Just a quick question. Do you take recycling and non-recyclable waste? Absolutely not. Absolutely not, no. So... We really, really need people to be putting their recycling into their green recycling bin so that it can be made into new products. So that's all of your paper, card, glass, metal, and rigid plastic. So that's plastics that you can't scrunch up. So crisp packets, for example, are not recyclable, but the trays that you get things like fruit and meat sometimes in, those ones that you can tap, they're quite rigid, those are all recyclable. We don't want those coming through here because this power station was specifically designed to burn this sort of mixed residual household waste. So your recycling goes to Chelsea Meadow, goes to an amazing state-of-the-art facility run by Viridor, where it gets sorted into different materials and sent for reprocessing. In normal circumstances, the crane would have one other job, which is to feed the waste into the hopper over here. So this is like the top of a big funnel and the waste drops down and what we're going to do you're going to lose me again for another moment um, we're going to go down to the bottom of where that waste falls onto the grate and you get a unique opportunity as i said to see inside the boiler okay shall i hand over and go on to mute while i walk down fantastic yes that's great thank you very much jane um so okay. everyone watching thanks so much for your questions so far keep sending them in jane will answer those as, as many as she can now um remember as well to keep filling in your schematic diagram so we've seen where the waste is stored and it's moved over to the furnace to be burned jane's now going to move to the boiler room to actually see where all the machinery um, is required to actually generate the heat. Um, the furnace is, part, is really the core part of the power plant where we generate heat, which we can then use and convert into electricity. So Adam, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you. So what the power station is, is a ginormous steam engine. And if you stop people in the street and say, do we still use steam engines? Some people may say yes, but most people will say, wow, I love steam engines, but they were part of our industrial history, thinking back to the steam locomotives and the big steam engines that worked in Devon and Cornwall, that we see the big old engine houses. And they think that it was perhaps a technology from our industrial past. But that's not the case at all. Most of the world's electricity in big, what we call thermal power stations, is generated by steam power, by boiling water to high pressure. Now, I bet most of you, when you think of a steam engine, think of an engine a bit like this. Let me just make sure you can see it. So you have a boiler. This is the lovely Mamod model where you heat up the water, and as the steam comes out, it goes up a little pipe and into a cylinder, and a piston goes back and forth. And this is how steam locomotives worked, and sort of how the big mine and other factory steam engines started to work for about 150, 200 years. And something you should all be very proud of the steam engine was invented in Devon, round about 1720, by a man called Thomas Newcomen, near to Dartmouth, so very near to Plymouth. And that's when the world started to have engines 
to do work for us. It's a Devon invention. So this is the traditional type of steam engine with a cylinder pushing a piston back and forth. And in a short while, after we've been through the hall with Jane where the fires burn to boil water, we'll see a different kind of steam engine that was invented rather than 300 years ago, was invented 100 years ago, called the steam turbine. And this is the kind of steam engine that works in the power station we're in in a moment. So more of that to follow. But this is a big, big steam engine plant. Lovely. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Um, so I'm actually kneeling in the hatches that open into our boiler. Normally I wouldn't be here because there would be a fire burning in there at about 1,000 degrees. We burn 30 tonnes of waste an hour. And up here you can see the waste table. So that's where the waste drops out of the bottom of the funnel that we saw up in the control room. And it falls onto this grate here, which is a series of steps that normally would move very slowly backwards and forwards, shuffling the waste down the grate until we have the ash falling off at the bottom. Obviously, I couldn't hear you when I lost you in the stairwell, but I think probably you will all know about fire triangles and the three conditions that we need for combustion. And I don't know if we want now to also think about the other gases, because we do put air up underneath the grate to keep the fire burning. That air actually comes from the tipping hall, so it's the smelly air that we're drawing in here. And then up above me, you see this second duct up here? That's the secondary air that we inject above the fire for complete combustion. We have volatile compounds and things like that that we need to make sure are burnt off. So I have over here a lovely molecular diagram of a methane combustion reaction. So I don't know, Alice or Natalie, if the students have this in their pack to right. complete. Right, yes. So this will be part of the quiz for you guys to fill in afterwards. So um, keep an eye on that diagram and have a little think. So this is the smelly air that gets sent into the uh, combustion chamber. It contains methane because normally in a um, in landfill, methane gets released. This is a kind of a better method to deal with that waste instead of using putting it in landfill by actually burning it and converting it into water and carbon dioxide. Um, so that's something that we'll ask you to balance that equation later. Main steam line coming in is up there and then it goes off the high and low pressure headers and into the turbine which is down here. It's about 105.5 tonnes of steam an hour going into that turbine at 60 bar, that's 850 psi. The S-shaped pipe on top is a turbine bypass just in case we need to do any maintenance on the turbine but we don't want to shut down the whole plant. So we can send the steam straight through the exhaust ducts down there. And that goes to the air cooled condensers that we'll see in a moment. Some of the steam is actually bled off the turbine and sent into this tank up here. And that steam is sent to the dockyard for heating. So instead of using their fossil fuel boilers, they're now using steam that is generated by the power of waste. But the majority of the work done by the turbine is driving via a gearbox our generator. And that's generating electricity not just for us, but for the whole of the neighbour base next door. And surplus electricity is exported to the grid. Can you, Natalie, and others see the picture I'm holding up? Yes, we can see that nicely. Thank you. This is a picture, is a bit like the room that Jane's in at the moment. And by seeing that man standing next to this machine, it gives you an idea of the scale of these devices. And that big blue machine is this other kind of steam engine that I was talking about called a steam turbine. 
At one end of that huge blue container is the turbine, and I'll show you inside that in a minute. And at the other end is a big electrical machine called an electricity generator. And the steam goes inside that big blue, the, the big blue container. You can see pipes going in. Now, if we were to take the lid off that container, what you see inside is a huge set of what look like propeller turbine blades, like that. And if we were to lift them out, it would look a bit like this. Now, it just so happens I have a bit of a model of a different kind of turbine here. And this turbine is, in fact, what we call a gas turbine. But the principle is the same. The steam turbine came first and the gas turbine came after, and they work slightly differently. But what happens is steam at high pressure passes in and passes through all of these little turbine blades. In fact, I only have half of the set of blades here because half of them, like here, go round and round and round. And the other half, which slip in between all the blades here, stay still. So we have a rotor and a stator. A rotor spins round and a stator stays still. And as the steam forces its way through these blades, it causes the whole thing to spin around. Now, whereas our first steam engines reciprocated, that meant they went back and forth, back and forth, the big advantage of the spinning steam engine was that the direction of the moving bits didn't have to keep changing. And by continually spinning in one direction, these machines could work more efficiently than the reciprocating engine. In fact, the turbine, the steam turbine, was invented by an Irishman working in Newcastle on time. His name was Charles Algernon Parsons. And he knew his invention would be better than the reciprocating engine. And he tried to show off to the Royal Navy, who, were, who already had their dockyard in Plymouth, and most of their ships worked on this kind of steam engine, the reciprocating. And originally they said to Mr. Parsons, who invented this, no, we don't want your new invention. So what he did was built his own ship, because Newcastle was good at building ships. He turned up at a Navy day and drove his ship in, which went about three times as fast as the reciprocating engine ships. And very quickly, the Navy changed to the turbine. And that's where the engine in this power station comes from. It's one of... Um, of Amazing, Adam. That, you have so much Thanks. knowledge of the history of this. It's so cool. I'm, I'm just going to pass on to Jane and then we're going to need to move on to the Q&A. So, Jane, thank you. Hi, yes, I'm back. So the very last bit, we've come to the outside of the turbine hall and you might be able to see there's a pipe here coming out. This is the steam that we've bled off for the dockyard. So that steam goes across, down and off. And this is the pipe that we saw from the access roads when we first started the tour. But there's also a much larger steam pipe coming out, which goes up and away from us. And that is the spent steam that we can't do anything useful with. It's only 40 degrees. It's way below atmospheric pressure. And we suck it out of the turbine and just go along here. I can show you the very last bit of the water steam cycle where we use giant cooling fans to condense it back into water. So we're just coming under the steam bridge here. We can pause momentarily to observe the difference in volume between a gas and a liquid. So there is the spent steam pipe going over the top of the air-cooled condensers, and this much smaller pipe below is the condensate, that's the water, coming back into the boiler. And the way that we condense it is with these giant fans. We've got five of them looking along there. And I'll just look up into one for you so you can see the sort of size of the blades. And normally these would be turning in the winter relatively slowly, 
Maybe in the summer when it's warmer, we need more air to condense the steam, so they will turn a bit faster. Jane, so can Natalie, I just Alice, ask you, how oh, many, on, yes. oh, sorry, how many litres of water do you use at the station every, I don't know, every day oh, or every... Oh, gosh, that's a really good question. I have a feeling our operations manager is sitting quietly in the background. How many litres of water, Jess? Sorry, I forgot. Hello, all. So in the summer, because we don't send as much heat to the dockyard, as much steam to the dockyard, we use a lot less water. So it depends on summer and winter. So in the winter, we use a lot more because we're sending a lot of steam to the dockyard. So normally we send about, in the, in the winter, we send about 15 to 20 tonnes an hour of steam out to the dockyard. And they only return a portion of this. So we have to make this up using water from town's water, we call it. Great, thanks yes. so Jane has very kindly showed us around the entire energy from Waste Plant in a whistle-stop tour, and we hope you've uh, managed to see all the bits and pieces there. Let's just summarise super quickly what we've seen. We've seen that this is a useful alternative to landfill. We're burning waste that can't be recycled. They use it to heat up water to, in pipes to make steam. That steam has lots of kinetic energy. It powers a turbine and generates electricity. So Although this is really useful as an alternative right now, we need to remember that it still is burning stuff. We're still um, making combustion. So that still has a carbon footprint associated with it. In future, of course, we want to be able to capture this carbon, but still it's probably better to just use and produce less waste as much as we can. Um, but in the meantime, this is an amazing use of our waste that, of course, non-recyclable waste that we, that we some of it's unavoidable. So um, something to discuss anyway in your classes afterwards. Now, I think we're going to carry on with the Q&A. So you'll meet some amazing engineers and I'm going to pass on to Alice, who will lead this part for you. Okay, hello everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, so we have some fantastic engineers who are joining us along with Jane um, and they will each give a brief summary of what they do and their career path so far um, while you send in some questions. There's a few questions in the chat that haven't been answered yet so hopefully we'll, we'll tackle mm -hmm. those in a minute. Um, so first up we have Jack Mason. Jack if you could introduce yourself please. Yep, so I'm Jack Mason and I'm a university student at Plymouth University. Um, I'm currently on a placement year, so I'm actually working for Babcock, which is in the Devonport dock site. Um, so I'm currently working for the submarine division um, and working on those for a year before I go back to university. Brilliant. Um, and next we have um, Paul Carey. If you could introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Paul. Um, I'm also an engineer. I'm at the other end of the uh, career and I'm very old and I've done lots of things in my life um, but I started out as a civil engineer building uh, concrete structures and pipelines and things like that and slowly moved into the power station business and the energy from waste business but now I don't really do any more engineering I'm a manager I'm the managing director and that means sometimes I get to tell people what to do which is good fun but I also have to let them make decisions. People like Colin, who's with us today, makes lots of de decisions on how to operate the plant. And I just um, overview the, the whole business and make sure that the business is, is successful. So I'm an engineer now turned into a managing director. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and next we have the operations manager, Colin James. Hello all. Um, I started out my career in the Royal Navy. Um, and that's where I learned about all these machines and turbines and pumps and motors and things like that. So I started off as an engineer in the Royal Navy. Um, after 14 years, I then left and joined MVV in the energy from waste sector. And I actually started out as an assistant shift team leader. So I was walking around making sure all these bits of equipment are all running OK and they all sound OK and there's no leaks and things like that. And then I moved up, up a little bit, a couple of promotions, and now I am the operations manager, so I'm in charge of the team that then looks after all the equipment. And I decide how this equipment is all ran and what started and what stopped. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, we have Karen Friendship, who's the managing director of an engineering company based in Plymouth. So, Karen, could you introduce yourself, please? 
Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Karen. Uh, a bit like Paul, I'm a managing director now of a business in Plymouth called Alderman Tooling. And um, I have a, a team of 50 engineers and production operators um, working for me. Um, and what we do is we make lots of metal components out of sheet and bar and tube. And we serve a lot of different industry sectors. So some of the pipe work and brackets that you saw in, in, the, in the videos, we could have made in our factory in Plymouth. Um, we have so much cool equipment. We have laser machines, welding equipment, powder coating, all sorts. Um, but ultimately, we make lots of bits of metal. But I didn't start my career either as a, a manager. You know, you don't start there. Um, I did a, a degree in civil engineering, having uh, really excelled in the sciences. Um, and don't get, be fooled that this is all for the boys because it's so not. Um, there are so many exciting careers, and if you've got a passion for making things, building things, breaking things, you know, engineers, the, the, the role is so portable, um, you know, where you start is often not where you finish, um, and so a career in STEM, you know, you can take it anywhere, but it just shows that engineers are just basically problem solvers, so, um, you know, if you have a passion for it, you go for it. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. So a, a great set of engineers. And we've got some some questions that we haven't answered yet in the chat here. So um, let's see which one. Um, well, some some basic ones first. Could you tell us exactly where in Plymouth the, um, the power plant is? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's an obvious one. Um, so it's actually in what used to be Western Mill Lake. So it's on the very edge of the dockyard. It is inside the dockyard's boundary, but we lease this this bits of land for our operations and because we're supplying energy to the dockyards it makes sense for us to be nearby. Brilliant, thank you. Um, what have we got next? Um, is there a weight limit for the waste that you can take? That's an interestingly phrased question. Um, so what we try to do is minimise the number of vehicles that deliver to us so all of the dust carts from Plymouth that are collecting from your homes will come straight into us, but the waste that comes from further away, we also take waste from most of the Devon districts and also from Torbay, that waste will be bulked up. So it will go into an Arctic, a sort of 40 tonne lorry, and that will be one lorry instead of lots of dust carts coming to us. We are not allowed under our planning conditions to accept lorries bringing less than four tonnes of waste. And this was to avoid having lots and lots of small vehicles coming in at all hours of the day. Does that answer the question? Brilliant, thank you. Um, how long did it take to build the plant? I don't know who wants to answer that one, but interesting to get a sort of civil engineering perspective on it, maybe. Uh, go on then, Paul. <laughs> um, it was just over three years. So we started in 2012 and we finished in the summer of 2015, which by my calculations is three years. Brilliant. So uh, the next question is, where does the waste go after, after the burning? So what's left over is the ash you would be thinking about. So the ash that falls off the grate is about 20 to 25% by weight of what's come in as waste. But that's not a waste. That's still a resource. So that ash gets taken off site for processing. It goes up to a site at Exeter. And all of the metals are removed for recycling. And the ash itself that's left over is processed by size. And it's used as aggregate in construction and road building and that sort of thing. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and we've got a question about the waste gases. How do you stop them from polluting the air? That's another excellent question. Jesse's sitting quietly in the background. I'll take that, Jesse. Do you want me to jump in? <laughs> it's entirely up to you. All I was going to do was talk about the two things that we add. You can go for it. Yeah. So as the flue gas comes up off the fire, it goes through the process. And at certain points, we inject certain things, sodium bicarbonate, urea, and what this these do is they neutralize or mix with the nasty, any nasty things in that flue gas. These are also activated carbon as well, and this acts like a sponge and captures all heavy metals and mercury. The flue gas then goes through onto these big filter socks, and there's over 2,000 of these filter socks and nothing can get through. Just like a sock on your foot, it captures all the dirt on the outside of this sock. 
And then all the, all the nasty chemicals are then knocked off and taken away. And the flue gas then goes through this sock. So any air goes through this sock and then is drawn and then up our, up our stack. So nice clean air. Clean air. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a question now. Um, I don't know who wants to answer this one, but was engineering your first choice of career? Is, uh, is I don't know who wants to take that one. Alice, I'm very happy to, to share my experiences. Um, That'd be great. Uh, I started off doing all the, all the physics and the sciences at school because actually that's what I was more keen on. Um, that kind of led me into the maths and the physics side because they were my two strongest subjects. And I wanted to choose um, a career path that would make someone employ me. So it had to be practical. I wanted to be engaged and I wanted to build things. So um, engineering rolled off the tongue really easily. Um, so then I went and did some research at all the university degree courses. And I plumped for civil engineering um, because we, we did a, at school a little competition on building a bridge out of balsa wood and lollipop sticks. And I really caught my um, inspiration from that. Um, but having learned and done a degree in engineering, I certainly don't use it day to day hands on right now. But it does show you what you can do with um, such a qualification. Um, and, you know, now, now I run a bit like Paul, run a team of 50 people um, that all, you know, make clever, clever things. Um, and I really, really enjoy my, my, my career. So I started, I started in engineering and I've ended up somewhere else, but um, still in it. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, so we're going to take one final question. Sorry, we're a bit short of time. But um, the question is, did you study engineering at university? Um, so I don't know who wants to, to take that one. I could jump in here because I technically am still studying uh, engineering at university. Uh, so I study mechanical engineering. Uh, so I've done two years at university. I'm now away for a year uh, doing a bit of work experience. Uh, so I spend a year in different placements within the dockyard. Um, and then I will head back to university to graduate from my bachelor's degree. And then I'm going to stay on and do a master's degree before returning back to the dockyard. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, did Paul, did you want to? Well, I was just going to say, if you want to, if you want to consider engineering right now in year seven, is the time to be focusing on maths and sciences, physics and chemistry even biology as well, because there's also bioengineering you can do. So focus on all of those sciences and maths and English, because you need to be able to write as well. So all those subjects are important. That's great. Thank you. And that actually answers uh, the question that we've just had from Mr. Lyons' class. So, uh, so that's great. <laughs> OK, I think that might be all we've got time for on the questions, I'm afraid. There's been some brilliant ones. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand back to Natalie. So we're going to finish up there. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you to the amazing and inspiring engineers who have joined and told us a little bit about their careers. We hope you found that really inspiring and we hope you've enjoyed learning about the uh, very many ways that you can uh, generate heat and convert it to electricity because this, of course, is going to be used in nuclear power plants, coal power plants. So this is a really general method of energy generation. Okay, so we hope you've enjoyed the event and thank you so much for joining us.